I'm often asked, what are the big lessons I've learned from investing in property? And some would suggest successfully for close to 50 years. Now, probably one of the big lessons I learned was that the property markets are cyclical. They're not just driven by the fundamentals, but also by the irrational and erratic behaviour of an unstable crowd of investors and home buyers. So while home buyers create the property market and keep pushing the values up, it's the erratic behaviour of the investors that create the ups and downs of the cycles. I guess what this has taught me is never to get too carried away when the market's booming, but also never to be too disenchanted when the market slumps. I've learned letting emotions drive your investments is a surefire path to disaster. Now today I'm going to chat with Brett Warren about some of the lessons I wish I'd known when I first started investing. The aim of this is, of course, if you can learn some of these lessons now, you can avoid paying some of the learning fees I had to pay. I had to pay the property markets dearly as I learned these mistakes. Now, today's episode is part of what I'm calling our summer series, where apart from bringing you one new show each week, we we're playing two previously published shows. I believe the foundation lessons I'm going to share with you in today's session and other summer series shows are going to help you take advantage of the property cycle that's appearing in front of our eyes, this new property cycle. Now, this particular podcast was recorded a couple of years ago, but the lessons are still very relevant today. But before we get into the main body of the podcast, I'd like to share two more lessons with you. Lessons I've learned over the years that I would have loved to know when I first started investing, but I couldn't learn until I'd been investing for a couple of decades. The first one is that every year there's an X factor, an unexpected factor that comes out of the blue that undoes my best laid plans. Sometimes these X factors are on the negative side and they turn down the market. But sometimes they're on the positive side, like the unexpected election win in 2019. Remember when Liberals won the unlosable Labour election and all of a sudden those tax regimes, those tax changes that people were concerned about that would drive down the property market, they didn't come to fruition and our property markets boomed. Another lesson that I've learned over the years, and it's taken me a couple of decades to understand, is that every 10 years or so, the world breaks. Think about 2020 with coronavirus creating a world pandemic and a world recession. Then look back at 2008 and 2009, the global financial crisis again broke down the world. And before that, there was the Asian financial crisis. And I can go back every 10, 12 years or so, and I've found the world breaks. What these lessons have taught me is to have a long-term focus and not to make 30-year investment decisions based on the last 30 minutes of news. They've also taught me to ignore the doomsayers because they've been around all that time too. And it's taught me to be very cautious of whose forecasts I pay attention to. Now, there's lots more lessons in today's show. So welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. I'm often asked, what I would do differently if I could live my investing journey all over again. Boy, there's a lot of things I'd do differently knowing what I know now in all elements of my life. And I was just having a chat with my business partner, Brett Warren, about that. And we we shared some war stories and uh, also some successes. So we thought we'd have a bit of a chat with you about it too. So hi, Brett. Hi, Michael. Good to be talking to you again. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to to go back and talk to your old self, your your 20-year-old self, and say, hey, do it this way. Don't be so smart. Don't be so stubborn. Yeah, absolutely, Michael. Look, I think it's a it's a great opportunity to to share with our audience some of the things that we both wish we'd we'd learned from and and uh, and changed when we, we first started. But I guess uh, hindsight's everything, isn't it? Oh, wouldn't it be good? Uh, but I think one of the things I learned along the way is that you've got to just keep going. You've got to be resilient. And along the way, I've paid some huge learning fees. 
Today, though, it's much easier. I guess one of the excuses I'd make if people ask me, Brett, is there weren't the blogs, there weren't the podcasts, there weren't even Australian books then. So property investment in those days was in some ways a, a secret men's club. The, the results would come out once a year, sometimes once a quarter you'd find out what prices were. And so you had to have access to data. You had to have access to the estate agents who, who kept all the knowledge to themselves Today, there's no shortage of information. I guess what there is a shortage of, though, is perspective. Look, that's a really good point. I think the other thing too, Michael, is uh, access to mentors 10, 15, 20 years ago was very, very difficult. Sharing their insights, learning from their mistakes and fast-tracking your process was extremely difficult. I know when I first started out, but now you've got the podcasts, you've got uh, you know, the tools on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, there is really no excuse. You're right, but maybe there is one. Ego. People think I can do it myself. So maybe we could just work through some of these lessons that uh, we, we've learned and see if we can help others by learning from our mistakes rather than theirs. Yeah, great. Fantastic. So, Michael, what is the first thing you wish you knew when you started investing? Well, I guess it's what we started to say already, the value of education, because At that time, I guess there wasn't as much knowledge around, but I also thought I knew it all. Uh, But that wasn't the case, of course. I didn't know what I didn't know. See, what I was lucky with, Brett, was my first couple of investments were successful, but the worst thing that can happen to a beginning investor is to get it right first time. You think you're smarter than you are, when in truth, my early success really was just because of a rising market rather than my own brilliance. I bought a property, 17 Last Street, South Caulfield, that I went halves with my parents. It was Two streets away from the school I went to was a street away from where my mum went shopping. It was my patch. It's what I knew. And also it was at a time when Gough Whitlam came into power and inflation went up. And it just was a coincidence, a a beautiful falling together of a a perfect storm of events that made that property go up, the rent go up, and boy, did I think I was smart. Thankfully, Over the time, I I started learning in better ways from books, from teachers, from mentors. I learned I've got to pay consultants for advice. And Brett, still today, I continue with my education and my personal development. We both have business coaches and mentors. Uh, We still believe that's the way to go. Yeah, I think that's something that uh, that resonates with me as well. Uh, All the top mentors that I've worked with, they're continually learning and educating themselves. There's no ego there they're always willing to learn. So I think that's very, very important. Well, even this year, you and I have employed to help us at Metropole, Simon Bowen, who's a a very expensive mentor, but very good in helping just us get our message along the way. And it's interesting because there's so many mentors out there at the moment, and that's the trouble. You've actually got to find somebody who has been successful, achieved what you want, but also has held on to it for a while. It's just too easy today to get a website up, to get a podcast up and pretend that you know what you're doing. Absolutely. Look, you've got to dig a little deeper, don't you? And I know, especially in these uncertain times, I prefer to be dealing with someone who has those decades of experience rather than just, you know, a couple of years. Well, I guess another lesson I would have liked to understand better at the beginning is the importance of setting goals. See, Brett, I knew I wanted to be rich. I came from a poor background, from a migrant family. We didn't have the wealth that my friends' parents had, my parents' friends had, and I saw that they had done it through real estate, so I just wanted to to get rich. But that's not a good enough goal. It's not measurable enough. It's not specific. And I still see that today with the clients at, at Metropole. I guess you probably see it as well. They're just a bit vague about what they want. Certainly, yeah. Look, uh, you know, everyone wants to be wealthy or I think the slogan is financially free. It really comes down to a lot more than that. And I know one of the success habits from uh, from Stephen Covey is uh, is begin with the end in mind and set clear and specific goals. And I know that's something that we work a lot on with our clients. I like to use the plane analogy, Michael. I think most people, the last time they went on holiday, they knew the airport they were flying to, the hotel they were staying at, and all the little details. But most property investors just pop up in a plane and hopefully they, they get to where they're going to go. There's, there's more of a hope strategy. 
That's a good point. I remember one of our mentors, Jim Rowan, said, if you don't design your own life plan, chances are you're going to fall into somebody else's plan. And then he went on to say, guess what they got planned for you? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> so it is important to set goals. And I know that's why you and your team put strategic property plans together because one of the other things is uh, that sometimes the goals aren't realistic. So it's important to know what you can achieve and what you can't achieve. Yeah, great point. Uh, the next one's really important, something that I learned quite early on as well. It was to create a team rather than, I know your one of your favourite sayings is if you're the smartest person in your team, you're in trouble. But how did you go about creating a team, Michael? Well, it took me a while to realise that, Brett, because similarly, I thought I knew things. Look, yeah, there's 25 million property experts in Australia. Everyone's lived in a house of some sort or a property of some sort. So most people think they know a bit about property. And while Property investment may be simple, it's not easy, and that's not a play on words. To be successful in property investment, it takes skills, and sometimes those skills should come from, from other people, people who know more about it than you do. So I agree with you, one should create a good team of mentors, advisors, your brains trust, as I like to call it. And as you said, uh, if you're the smartest person in your team, you, you're in trouble. So I learned that when I could stand the, on the shoulders of my mentors, I could see a lot further. I probably didn't learn that until into my 40s, though. If I would have done that earlier in life, Brett, I'd be further along faster and I wouldn't have had as much hardship and I wouldn't have paid the market as many learning fees because there are things you learn along the way that come at a cost of time, emotion or money, which is even worse. Absolutely. Uh, no, look, some really strong points there. And what have you got to for us next, Michael? Some of the things you wish you knew uh, before you started investing. Well, I came from a, a poor background, as I said. Not that I ever went without a meal, but I didn't, I guess, think like a rich person. And it really was in the 1990s I understood the psychology of success. It took me a while to learn to think like a rich person because if you believe that you deserve to be rich, if you believe you deserve to be successful – you will achieve that. The problem that I see is a lot of people have their wealth operating system, their thermostat set for too low a level. And the problem is your income will seldom exceed your personal development. That's why it's important to develop the mindset of rich people and the rich habits of successful property investors. And interestingly, I'm very proud of my book that I've written with Tom Corley that's now been translated into five languages has just gone into Polish as well, of all places. And interesting, Brett, my, you probably don't know, my maternal grandfather was born in Poland. I've actually never been back. So uh, it's going to be a reason to go, go, another reason to go back in some ways. So another great quote from one of my mentors, Jim Rohn, don't wish it were easier, wish you were better. Don't wish for less problems, wish for more skills. So I learned along the way the importance of, of my own personal development. Again, one of the excuses I could have used is, well, there wasn't as much of it around, but there was. Jim Rowan was around, then Zig Ziglar was, Brian Tracy was. Yeah, you had to buy C, well, not CDs. You used, I used to buy, buy tape sets and, and, and books in those days. But when I started to do that, I grew my headspace, my mindset, and then my results improved. Yeah, look, I, I can certainly attest to that, uh, the, the book you've read, Michael. It's a fantastic book and I think people could do a lot worse uh, than when they start to read that book and understand those little points and little habits about thinking and behaving. Uh, it'll certainly make a difference before you start investing. Well, Brett, let me share something with you. One of the first books I re remember reading about real estate came from America and it was uh, The Courage to Be Rich by I think his name was Mark Haroldson. In fact, I still have it. It's out of print. And I didn't understand it. What do you mean the courage to be rich? I knew I wanted to be rich. I knew I didn't like my current situation. So I didn't think I needed courage. It was a silly title, but it really was, even in those days, the smart people understood the importance of mindset in success. And I know you know it in the success in sport. It's, it, it's universal, this concept of having an abundant and a powerful mindset, isn't it? Yeah, look, that's a fantastic point. Um, talk to us a little bit more about that, that abundancy mentality. 
Well, to be successful, you actually do need an abundance mentality. Uh, analogy is a bit like you should think yourself of a cup. If your cup's small, you'll only accumulate a small amount of money and any extra will spill over, you'll lose it. You know, we talk about that at Wealth Retreat where all the opportunities, imagine just these cups on the seashore and the waves of opportunity coming in. And if you've got a small cup, it'll fill quickly. And if you've got a larger cup, you'll get more opportunities. And I don't want a cup, I want a bucket. The thing is, you can't save more. You can't become more than the size of your cup. So what you've got to do is grow yourself into a bigger cup by developing an abundant mindset, by believing you deserve to be wealthy and by turning up your wealth operating system. Yeah, some great points. And I think uh, without the abundance mindset, and if you do have a scarcity mindset, it, it brings on all, all other kinds of things like your ego and you know, fearfulness and greediness and things like that of, of other people. So I think that's really, really important. You're right. One of the things I probably was good at, but not a lot of people are, was the concept of delayed gratification. I was in a hurry to get wealthy, so I did put off a number of things, the overseas trips after university that some of my friends did. I got into it and I was in a hurry. But one of the things I see at the moment, Brett, are a lot of people can't resist instant gratification of buying the next shiny toy. Now, today I do. Hey, I waited two days for the latest iPhone. When the new <laughs> well iPad done. came out, even though it looks the same as my old one, I got it. But I now believe I've earned the right to do that. But I did understand the concept of saving, spending less than I earn, saving, investing. And now that I've got a big cash machine, I can do that. But a lot of people today believe that, uh, that they can just go off and borrow money from the banker on their credit card. And it's not your money to have, that your credit card's not your money. It's the banks and you pay interest for the privilege of using it. Now, that's one of the big challenges that a lot of younger people, and in fact, it stays with them and the older people do have, but the rich know that you've got to delay gratification as wealth is the transfer of money from the impatient to the patient. Is, is that skill dying, Michael, that delayed gratification? You've got people, you can push a button now and, and dinner shows up on the doorstep. You've got credit cards and, you know, all those kinds of delayed payments and PayPal. Uh, is, it, is it harder to find and harder to, to hold on to, delaying gratification? Clearly, it definitely is. Brett, everyone today is used to having credit cards. I'm a little bit older than you, and I remember when the first credit cards came out and they were called a bank card in those days and then there, there was american express and diners club from overseas but the australian banks all got together before mastercard and, and visa and all of a sudden that actually came in the mail to you uh, and you had this ability to buy things that you didn't have to save for before there used to be something called lay by i don't know if you're old enough to remember that so if you wanted to buy something for christmas you'd go to the shop and you'd put some money down and each week when your pay packet came, you'd put a little bit more in and you'd put a little bit more down until you paid for it all and then you could take it home. Today, you take it home and somehow or other you've got to work out how to pay for it over the next little while. And you know what they do, they give you three months, three years interest free at Harvey Norman or places like that and then all of a sudden you've got to pay for it at a much higher interest rate. It's a trap, isn't it, Michael? Mm. Well, great point. Um, what else uh, we're talking about, uh, things we, we wish we knew when we started investing, uh, what else can you, have you got for us there, Michael? Well, one thing I'd mentioned to beginning investors is learn to overcome your fears. Now, interestingly, Brett, I didn't have fears, and that was probably one of my mistakes because I just thought it was simple and easy and you just bought a property and it went up in value, and it did initially, so that only compounded my uh, – unrealistic expectation because then when the first property market downturn came, it caught me. But the other extreme is actually being too nervous. Fear is a normal human emotion, but it's a powerful human emotion. And it's for a lot of people, they see investing as risky. Uh, however, if you've got a sound investment strategy and you've got a good team around you, you can minimise your risks. So I think the biggest risk actually is not with the property market, not with what interest rates are going to do, not whether you buy this property or that property, but it's with the investor. Let me explain what I mean. If people said to me, Michael, is doing a two, three, four, five townhouse development risky? 
I'd say, have you ever done one before? If they said no, I'd say, well, it's risky to you, but it's not risky to me. But if you ask Michael Yardy, is doing a, a multi-storey high-rise apartment building risky? Yes, it is, because I've never done it. But it isn't for Harry Trugerboff or Mervac or Lendlease. So it really just depends upon where you uh, your experience is. But in fact, if you haven't got that experience, Brett, you can hire it. There are people around nowadays to minimise your risk. It's a form of insurance. No, no, that's why people approach you and your team at Metropole, our team, um, to actually use some of our experience and our perspective to minimise their risks. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, You can always pay for perspective as well, can't you, Michael? Yes. Uh, uh, Another one, I guess, is a lot of people talk about failure holding them back. Um, Tell me a a little bit about that as well. Well, I think one of the most important characteristics of successful business people, entrepreneurs and investors is resilience because we all make mistakes. But the difference between ultra-successful people and the average Australian is that successful people don't let their failures hold them back. Instead, they get up and try again. And you've heard me say it, I'm a real success at failure. But most people worry about things that will never happen. And all this does is prevent them from achieving success. So they're worried about failure as opposed to even having done it. So instead, save your worry for what you can control when there's something to worry about. As you can see, there are a number of things I've learned along the way that have helped me become a more successful investor. Um, And one of them is don't be worried about failure. Mitigate those risks, though, by getting a good team of people around you and don't speculate. Um, And the other thing, I guess, is don't worry too much about what other people are going to say either. Yeah, good point. I, I think some of these points are starting to overlap, aren't they, Michael, with uh, with getting a team around you and, and learning the lessons from that team and, and having someone there who's who's blazed the path there before you to, to learn from them. Another thing that uh, that a lot of people and a lot of beginning investors talk about, it's, it's cash flow positive or negative and not really understanding how to build a level of wealth. And sure, cash flow is important, but there's other factors that are important when you're looking to build and create wealth. Uh, how did you learn that lesson? I didn't have to worry about that when I was young because it was well understood that residential real estate was a high growth, relatively low yield investment. So one didn't invest for cash flow then. Having said that, my initial investment spread, I used to get a 10% yield. So today you get 3%, 3.5% yield. If you're lucky, I got 10%. But Brett, at the time, my interest rates were 10, 11, 12%. So therefore, it was higher returns proportionately, higher yields, but it cost more and was in an inflationary environment as well. So no, there was no question in my mind, cash flow positive, cash flow negative. But then People like Robert Kiyosaki and other people from overseas came in and said, hey, your investments have to be cash flow positive. And it taught a whole generation or number of generations now to expect that. Now, if I invested in New Zealand, I'd be investing under totally different tax rules and I would be talking about cash flow positive properties. If I invested in America, which I don't, I would similarly be expecting cash flow positive properties because the tax rules are different there, the way they do things is different there. But in Australia, I learned from the few mentors I had that not to expect that. Having said that, I didn't really fully understand the power of compounding and leverage, the power of if you buy high growth properties and they outperform because of their location, I just stumbled upon this until it started to make sense that if you can grow at 8% per annum rather than the average 7% per annum, just that little increase by being in a better location means that over five years, your property's grown more, the rent's gone up more, you've got more deposit for your next property, and that compounds on the compounding, and the gap gets bigger and wider over the years. And if you can outperform even more by choosing even better locations or manufacturing some capital growth. So that's a lesson I didn't understand as well, that the large part of your Asset growth happens, A, because capital growth is tax-free, but also in the latter years of your property ownership. And that's, again, this delayed gratification because in the first couple of years, it doesn't make 
that much difference in 5% or as opposed to 8 or 9% capital growth because it's only talking tens of thousands of dollars, but it compounds and grows and then using leverage and time to combine all those, boy, does that create a cash machine. Well, absolutely. And it is the, the growth and the compounding, the leverage that, that does the heavy lifting. It's, the cash flow is not going to create wealth for you. And I guess that's the biggest mistake we see with uh, with beginning investors. They come to us after they've gone down the cash flow path and you know interest rates maybe have risen, their, their profits are getting taken away with tax and they're, they're left with assets that just aren't growing in value. The problem is most people invest in residential real estate because they're looking for cash flow. They're wanting to replace their income. The trouble is that's not how residential real estate works. I remember when I was sitting in your chair and people were seeing new clients, they'd say, hey, I'd like to buy an investment property and you'll pay for my school fees. Hey, I'd like to buy an investment property and you'll pay for my holiday. No, it doesn't work that way. You've got to go through the various stages. The first stage is educating yourself. The next stage of your investment journey is building an asset base. And then you can slowly lower your loan to value ratios and add maybe commercial property or other things to then start getting cash flow but the initial stages mean you really got to have a full-time job. That's the problem, Brad. A lot of people are looking for residential real estate as a way of getting out of the workforce. Wrong way around, you actually need your job so you can build an asset base. Yeah, really good point. And, and I guess that leads to the next one, which is the, the Get Rich Quick scheme. We've talked a little bit about the, the innovations and the Instagrams and Facebooks and everything looks rosy and people want to leave uh, their job behind and get on with that. But property is not a Get Rich Quick scheme, is it? No, it isn't. And you may have heard me say before that it takes probably 30 years to develop a significantly big asset base to start to live off it. Now, most people haven't got that much time. So when people come in their 50s and 60s and say, look, I want to retire in 10 years time and I want to live off my property portfolio. Well, sorry, you've left it too late. On the other hand, a lot of young people miss out on those early years when they've got good cash flow, when they've got good jobs, when they've got a long runway to be able to build up their asset base. So having invested uh, for, well, close to 50 years now, I've learned a lot of lessons along the way. And one of them is that residential real estate is not a get-rich-quick scheme. But yes, I get the same emails in my inbox that you do, buy seven properties in seven minutes and 10 properties in 10 years as Warren Buffett said, somebody's sitting in the shade today because someone else planted a tree a long time ago. So I'm able to, to not have to have delayed gratification, enjoy a nice lifestyle, enjoy good holidays because I planted that tree a long, long time ago. Yeah, it's a great quote. Look, there is a lot of white noise out there. Who do you listen to? Who do you turn to? The, the news is up and down every day. Uh, talk to me about some of the lessons you've learned there. Well, this is a newish phenomenon. It's not, it uh, wasn't around when I uh, was first starting investing. And I guess what I learned over the years is it's not the media's job to educate you. It's their job to entertain you, to get you to click on their links, to get you to read the advertisements because that's how they get paid. So the media is more than ever giving negative messages because they know that we're going to click on negative news as opposed to positive news. So it's hard to ignore the white noise. It's hard to keep your eyes on your long-term goals while not taking uh, notice of the short-term market challenges. I mean, most of this year, 2020, when we're recording this, um, there's been challenges in the marketplace and it's hard not to allow them to get to you especially with social media with instagram twitter where things are happening straight away having said that you've got to keep your eye on the big picture because that's what's going to get you to where you want to go because the long-term trend for residential real estate is up but there's always the short-term ups and downs along the way and if you get too carried away by those you're going to miss out the great long-term opportunities. Yeah, I think this is also, Michael, an ideal time to have a mentor and you know a professional team around you because you, there is a lot of fear and you, you can lose touch of where you need to be. But by having uh, that unreasonable friend, as you like to call it, um, you know, putting you in, in the right place and, and showing you where you need to be, and, and that only comes from, from decades and decades of experience, not years of experience as we spoke about before. 
Well, they'll see your blind spots, they'll see what you're not seeing, and they'll also ground you because we need that at times. When you and I have mentors, we have something in common and we mentor each other as, as well. It's just too hard to do it on your own. Some people still try, and I love the saying that alone I can run faster, uh, but together we can run further. Of course, that's not true. I can't run faster than you, but I think you know what I'm getting at. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, we're talking to Michael Yardney about uh, the things we wish we knew when we started investing. What else have you got for us, Michael? Well, I think one of the things I learned along the way is the importance of cash flow. So as I said initially, I was always investing for capital growth, and that was working really nicely till the market turned. And in the early 90s, I saw a number of my friends go bankrupt uh, partly because of the recession we had to have, others because the banks took their properties. So even though residential real estate is a high growth, relatively low yield investment, the key to becoming wealthy is to own investment grade properties that increase in value. But you do need the cash flow to keep you in the game and you need solid cash flow buffers to see you th ride through the ups and downs. And I learned that from some of my mentors in the 19. 90s. I must admit, Bill Zeng, who at that time was running Investors Direct Finances, uh, taught me a lot about the, the rules of money and finance. And then there was Rolf Schaefer, who's been my partner in um, Metropole Finance when we were running that as a company. And more recently, there's a number of other great finance strategists that we use for our clients at, at Metropole. Um, and again, since the global financial crisis, this has become even more important. See, when I first started, finance wasn't easy. And then it got easier. And as we got to 2007, 2008, the time of the global financial crisis, it was the easiest I'd ever seen it. You could apply for loans online. You just had to be able to sign a form. There were cash flow mortgages, all sorts of things. And if we had gone much further along that route. We could have had a terrible property market crash like they had in America because people weren't able to substantiate their borrowing capabilities, their serviceability. So it is important to have cash flow and it has become even more important now, A, to sustain your portfolio as it's growing and B, to live on your cash flow later in life when now living off equity, like I used to talk about for many years, really isn't a simple strategy anymore. In fact, not a strategy that works for most people. So it's important to understand the balance of cash flow to keep you in the game, capital growth to build a big enough cash asset base to, to get out of the game, and then having a balance of cash flow and capital growth as your end game so you can live off your property portfolio. Yeah, I think that's one of the lessons I learned very early on, Michael, from yourself was uh, having that that buffer in place and that cash flow buffer to buy time as well. I think that's a crucial a crucial part of a, a finance strategy and overall strategy. Very much so. It's got nothing to do with interest rates. It's got the ability. See, having a loan, having debt isn't a problem. Not being able to repay it is. And so when we put our clients into properties over the last couple of years and didn't spend their last cent, and some of those who were in a bit of a hurry said, no, no, I want to pay more. I want to buy more. And we said, no, you're not allowed to. This is your insurance. They're today very happy, aren't they, Brett, that they've yeah. got that back up during these slightly more challenging times. Yeah, really good point. So when it does come time to buy the property, Michael, and you've obviously bought and been involved in many transactions, what's some of the things you wouldn't negotiate on? Well, I always understood the concept that location is important, but I think it took a number of years for me to recognise that. I learned a little bit about property investing from my parents. I actually started with them and then they had a slightly different tact and they would buy properties whenever they had enough money, Brett, to buy a property worth $20,000. That was back in the 70s and the 80s. So in the first years, they bought in the closer inner suburbs. And then when they saved it a little bit more, that was their headspace. Interestingly, now that I look back at it, I'd never thought about this before, that I guess that was where their comfort zone lay. So they never bought anything worth more than $20,000. So then went out to the middle suburbs. And Brett, we, we buy a lot of properties for our clients in Bentley. That was, I remember helping them buy. I'd often do the buying of the properties was their money. We paid $18,000 for properties that today are 1.4, 1.5, an old house on a block of land. Um, 
And then they'd move further out and further out, and then they went across the highway, and eventually the last property they bought were out in the sticks as property values went up. And I saw over time that those inner suburban ones kept growing more and more, and the outer suburban ones floundered. So I, along the way, got the concept that 80% of your property's performance is due to its location and only about 20% is related to the property. So never compromise on the location. You've still got to get the right property, but we still see people looking for the next hotspot. Mm, yeah. it, it doesn't work that way, does it, Brett? No, absolutely. Uh, we know what's happened to yesterday's hotspots. Many of them have become the not spots, as we say many times. So just like my parents bought in the outer suburbs because it was cheap and they did it, not because they wanted to live there, but that's where they, in their headspace, thought they could afford it. Uh, the answer is they just didn't work in those areas, those properties, not as well. And interestingly, 40, 50 years later, there's nothing different. The gap between the better located properties and the outer suburbs just keeps growing wider and wider. Yeah, and, and those trends we've seen over the, the last few decades, uh, more importantly as well, now, obviously, to invest, there needs to be a certain, I guess, financial literacy as well. So I guess just keep it fairly basic. But uh, what are some of the lessons there? Well, interestingly, you're, you're right that you've got to have the financial discipline to start spending less than you, by spending less than you earn, by saving it. It's a bit hard today because if you put money into a savings account, you really don't get much for it. One, two percent doesn't matter. You then invest it in shares. Well, you see what's happened to the share market. But I think the lesson that was in that book, The Richest Man in Babylon, many, many years ago was to become rich, you've got to spend less than you earn, save the difference and eventually invest it. And that's a simple message, but it's true. The problem is today, too many people are throwing away money buying things they don't need with money they don't have to impress people that, that they don't really like. <laughs> so, so like true. Robert Kiyosaki says, if you don't know how to care for your money, money will stay away from you. Yeah, good. I like that one. Look, a couple more points to go. What about some things uh, outside of maybe what we were thinking or property related or finance related? What are some other lessons? Well, over the years, I've had more than my share of personal challenges, problems. In fact, some of them, many of them self-inflicted and self-created. And I learned that wealth means different things to different people. And chasing money, as I did in the first half of my life, doesn't necessarily get you anywhere. You actually have to be grateful. I learned over the years that the true wealth has nothing to do with how many properties you own, how much money you've got, how big your business or your share portfolio is. True wealth is what you're left with when they take all your money and your properties away from you. So you should be grateful. I think you need somebody, you need your health. I mean, the, the last year's shown us how important health is, but we've always known that. You need somebody to love and somebody to love you. You need to be able to enjoy your life by having time to learn to grow and I think another important thing that I've learned over the years is the importance of giving back to the community and charity so not just being grateful for what you've got now but I think it's important that if you get to the top it's your if you're lucky enough to get do well and get to the top I believe it's your responsibility to send the elevator back down to bring other people up and that's partly the reason why I started this podcast, it's to educate as many people about financial fluency so that they don't just become financially literate, but they're fluent. It flows the words and their thought processes, success oriented so that they can enjoy what's available to them. We live in a lucky country in a great time in history. So be grateful for what you've got and give back to the community and charity, Brett. I think they're really important messages. Thanks, Michael. I think we've covered quite a broad range of, uh, of topics there and, uh, and certainly a number of things that uh, we've both learnt throughout the time. Uh, anything else to add before we go? Yes, never stop learning. And uh, I think it's important to remember that you're also the mentor for your children. So we spoke a moment ago about how it's important for us to have mentors. But if you think about it, you spend a lot of time with your children and I'm now with, with my grandchildren. And it's interesting how I speak to my kids about what they've learned about money. And interestingly, rem they remember how I was when I was when I was much younger and when they were young and the influences I've had on them. So um, it's important, as I said a moment ago, not just to give back to the community, but be careful the lessons that you give to your children 
not just what you say, but it's what you don't say. And it's also what you do. They're watching you. Yeah. Look, some great points, Michael. I know when I first started off my journey, I always thought it was something big, uh, you know, flipping a house, doing a development, winning lotto, something big that would make the difference. But I think it's really important to understand some of these points because success really is just a number of these little habits uh, along the way that you pick up and, and learn from, aren't they? Yes, it is. So thank you. It's been a fun chat, Brett. Yeah. It was interesting how you dragged some old memories out of me. <laughs> Thanks for allowing me to say those. No, look, great to be with you. I appreciate your insights. Thanks, Michael. Well, I hope you got some lessons from the lessons I learned the hard way. I don't want you to pay the learning fee, and that's why I give you regular ideas on property investment money and success in this podcast as well as through my property update newsletter but rather than trying to work it all out on your own why not get my team at metropole to help you we have no properties for sale so our advice is independent unbiased and we help beginning investors get into the property market successful investors grow their portfolio and advanced investors get involved in high-end strategies like property renovations and development go to metropole.com.au it all starts off with us putting a strategic property plan together for you metropole.com.au now if you actually got benefit from today's show please tell somebody about it because i'd like you to help me in my quest to make as many people as financially successful or at least literate as possible so they understand what's going on so tell somebody about the show and if you want to tell the world leave me a review one star five star i don't care how many stars well i sort of do actually and i got a great five star review from brendan and if i read your review out as i'm going to read brendan's just email me michael at metropole.com.au and if i read your review out just email me michael at metropole.com.au and i'd love to say thank you by gifting you one of my books. Now, Brendan left a review a little while ago on iTunes saying informative and easy to follow. I love listening to your podcast as you offer a diverse range of information and opinions on property investment. I find the content interesting and easy to listen to, and I'm applying the knowledge gained from it on my own property investment journey. Thank you, and keep up the good work, Brendan. Well, thank you, Brendan, for taking the time to leave the review, and I'm really pleased that you're finding it useful and it's helping your own property investment journey. I hope to be part of it. So keep listening. And I want to be part of your life too, so follow me on any of the social media platforms. Just look for Michael Yardney or daily in my property update newsletter. We've had over 1.1 million Australians read it already this year, individual readers. So I'm really proud of its wide reach and I hope that you are also getting it each morning. Just subscribe at propertyupdate.com.au. I'll be back with you again real soon, twice a week on the Michael Yardney podcast. In the meantime, have a great week and make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney Podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you?